Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Plant Party, Foraging into Fall, hosted by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Funding for the program is provided by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. Plant Party is a quarterly webinar series intended for, the, for advanced plant training and fun education. My name is Charles Kniper. I'm the State Resource Conservationist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. My co-hosts are Tim Sigmund, the Private Lands Program Leader with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and Megan Clayton, Extension Range Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. We have 32 great door prizes we will be giving away today. I'd like to thank Bamert Seed, Bear Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seeds, Native American Seed, Pogue Agri Partners, Renewable Resources Extension Act, Texas Brigades, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for donating these neat prizes. Let's get some housekeeping out of the way. We'll be moving very quickly through five presentations today Please feel free to type your questions into the question and answer box and we will answer them privately to you through there. We'll also be sharing a link to the recorded webinar by the end of the week, but not the actual presentations. So be sure to take your own notes as we go. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Sigmund to start our introductions. Thanks, Charles. Our first presenter today is Jay Fuhrer. Jay worked with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service from 1980 to 2020 out of Bismarck, North Dakota. He particularly enjoyed working from the pickup tailgate on the field edge with the spade and the client, conservation planning one field at a time. Currently, Jay spends his time supporting soil health efforts for the Minokin Farm. The Minokin Farm is a conservation demonstration farm and his favorite place to work. At Minokin Farm, the five soil health principles can be applied while monitoring plants, animals, and soils. Jay's presentation is titled, Armor Up. Thanks for kicking off our plant party, Jay, and take it away. Well, good morning. Well, thank you, Megan and others for um, the invitation for the plant party. Uh, appreciate that, and good morning from the Northern Plains. So I'm just a few miles straight north of you. And uh, we're gonna walk through a few items this morning and we'll see if we can talk a little bit about armor. So that's our topic, armor up. And with that, I think we'll, we'll start. So we're gonna pick out uh, soil armor out of the principles and we're gonna discuss that one. And it's an item that um, uh, when conservation planning, it's uh, where I always start it. So I always start it with soil armor. Uh, because if we don't have that, things things don't progress very well. And you have to um, secure the landscape. And once you secure the landscape, uh, stabilize it from erosion, excessive heat, et cetera, then I think we got a whole different scenario coming. So what we're gonna look at today, uh, we're going to look at covers after harvest, covers with 60 inch corn, covers with soybean and canola, covers with spring wheat, and covers with sunflower. I think that's going to kind of give us an idea uh, of where we can start on, on these particular scenarios. So a few examples of what we do. Um, they're things that we put together for our methodology that fit our landscape. And yours is, is likely going to be different and as they all are, but this will give you an idea of what uh, some ways that you could put the scenario together. So when we start looking at this whole thing, uh, we can start with uh, covers after harvest. We're just gonna move to that right now. And covers after harvest uh, is, uh, is uh, one of the easier ones, but I just wanted to share this photo with you because this is kind of how we look right now. And so we're, uh, we're in a drought, uh, second year drought, and we're at about 45% of average precip, uh, both last year and this year. And so instead of a grain harvest, uh, virtually the landscape was chopped and removed. So it gives even more importance to the need for for covers into the methodology of the crop, cash crop itself. And so that's what we're going, going to start 
uh, looking at. So we're going to start with the crop after harvest. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea what one would look like in our neck of the woods. Um, I like the uh, the brown, the dead litter combined with the green. And so then we have a combination of things happening. So we have CO2 uh, going to the atmosphere from the brown and we got CO2 entering the soil with the green. And so one, one is uh, giving off CO2 and one is gathering CO2. And the two together do a really nice job. So this is one of the simpler ones, just to cover after harvest. And if your environment is such that it allows this, it's a nice way to do it. I like to come in with a combination of plants. Um, this is the one too that, um, you know, it's not our standard methodology. Uh, when you're looking at uh, cropping systems, you know, because we, we normally, we haven't evolved using covers so much. And so it's always kind of a new introduction uh, and acclimation, if you will. But this is probably the simplest one, simplest place to start. Okay. Cover after harvest. And then we can also look at growing the cover crop uh, with, with the crop. And so what I'm going to share with you here is, um, is our 60 inch corn uh, trials that we run at the Minokin farm that we really liked. And so keep in mind now, this is a pretty brutal year for us. So we're operating with very marginal rainfall, triple digit heat, and uh, of course a lot of smoke in our, in our air. And so uh, it's been a bit of a challenging year that way. But on the left side, you can see where we're introducing the covers. And so we're, we get the corn to a certain stage, uh, maybe V5 or so, right in there. And then we'll introduce the covers. Uh, we're seeding those in with the Truax grass drill. Works really nice for putting covers uh, in between the rows. And then the photo on the right shows you where it's just starting to emerge. So you're just starting to get emergence here. And so it's a nice compatibility. Corn doesn't like the cover early on, but a bit later, it has no issue with it. And so then you start to get a good compatibility going with the corn plant itself. So I tried to take all these photos in the same location. Uh, so this one on the left now, you can see where the corn's advanced a bit, and you can see where the cover crops are starting to emerge and they're starting to go pretty good here. They haven't had a rain on them, so it's been, been a slow situation, uh, been a bit challenging. So then I went, um, yesterday I took a drive out to the Minokin farm, and on the right side here, I, which is again, the same location of these photos, I drove, I, I walked a bit, uh, so I'm just gonna play that. Just kind of walked a bit so you can walk in here with me. This is one of the last cornfields standing uh, in the surrounding area. Everything else has been chopped off. It actually made some grain. So it stayed standing, made some grain. And so it's, it did well, but it had, it had a lot of plant support. Uh, so you get the, a nice connection of mycorrhizal activity underneath the soil. You get some nice plant support they can do some interesting things. So what did we plant out there? Here's a list of the species that went in between the corn rows. And keep in mind, this is, this is our list. You know, it's not, it's not your list. Yeah, your list would look different. And so, but it gives you an idea what kind of works in the Northern Plains. And so it's a combination of plants. They all bring something to the table. And I think it's just so interesting as given the type of year, you'll find that some evolve more than others. But it, it kind of gives you a look at it and kind of gives you a bit of an understanding about what, what was placed in here. Now, a couple of years ago, we had a, a even wetter than average year. And this is how our 60 inch corn looked. So. So it's, uh, it's interesting how it uh, stood the test of time, wet year, dry year, uh, but it definitely, had, it definitely comes to the table, uh, allows much more sunlight on the entire plant, 
And then your activities, whether it's pollinators or whether it's um, wildlife, uh, all you know, erosion, sequestering carbon, whatever your goals are, uh, you can design that cover crop in the center to meet those. And then you can also use perennials. Uh, we, we did that for a couple of years uh, where we left perennials, rotate, we have rotational perennials that move through the cropping system. And so what you're looking at here is, um, is corn that was growing with the, in between the perennials. And then the following year, we come back with that again. So that was corn with uh, 60 inch corn with covers. Uh, and then we can also look at soybean and canola. Those are two, two fairly big crops around here as well. And with that, uh, we put a, a cover like uh, cereal rye in the fall before. And then the following spring, it's a biennial that survives the Northern Plains winters. And so then the following spring, it'll look something like this. And then we'll graze it maybe get a couple of weeks of grazing out of it with our yearlings. Last year, I think we took off 90 pounds of beef per acre uh, before we started looking at planting a crop. So there's a window of opportunity to bring these yearlings onto a pretty high plane of nutrition. Then when we go to actually plant, uh, this is the easiest planting uh, that we have. Uh, the soil opens so easily and it closes so easily uh, when we're planting green. And so I, I really appreciate planting green. If it's a dry year, we can terminate that rye early. If it's a wet year, we can let that rye grow a lot longer. So it, it comes down to a, a management scheme. But we've been pleased with the results. Um, I've really liked uh, the soybeans and canola, uh, both uh, going into a green planting scenario. And it gives us a way to put a cover on the ground. So again, it's different than the corn. It's different than after harvest. This is a, a spring cover. And uh, so they're just different techniques uh, that you can use for getting a cover crop into a cropping system. Then we also had sweet clover and spring rye. And so if we look at those, again, the sweet clover is another biennial that survives the Northern Plains. Some people like it, some people don't like it. You find, you find what works in, in your landscape. And so this one brings a big taproot to us. And then we can go ahead and seed into it. So we can plant wheat. We plant our wheat uh, with the planter on 15 inches. So everything here is pretty much spring wheat. Uh, spring wheat and durum is the two small grains you're going to find here for the most part. Okay, so it's just another option, but it's a, a grass, the wheat going into a broadleaf, the clover. So again, it's got good agronomics. It's uh, not much, it's just in reverse of uh, picking a broadleaf like soybean and planting it into a grass like cereal rye. So you have, you have good agronomics on it. And then uh, we, we did have the severe heat, but we went uh, forward and uh, we had uh, still had a 24 bushel an acre um, uh, spring wheat yield that's 62 pounds, 16% protein. That's, that's good wheat, that's heavy wheat. And so we were, we were pleased with that outcome. And then the, uh, the last one was sunflower with covers. And so we got this for out of the Griffith family from Kansas uh, that uh, taught us this one. And we can put the cover crops in with the sunflowers all in one seeding operation. Everything's on 15 inch centers there. And so every other row is flowers. And so they do not object uh, to the covers being put in at the same time in a row crop scenario or you can put them into a um, solid seeded scenario, same species. And our species again are up here in the upper right. And these are all broad leaves uh, because the broad leaves into the sunflowers still allows you a grass herbicide for weed control. And so that, that's a workable situation that allows that to happen. So as the frost moves in, the flowers mature, frost moves in, the covers basically go down, the 
the flowers stay standing and makes for a nice clean harvest of just flowers. And so that, that works for us at the Minokan farm. And then as we harvest them, of course, then we have a high nutrition level. So when we bring livestock in, that's a high, high plane of nutrition and the covers are already there. And that makes for a nice situation in lieu of trying to put them on the landscape late in the season for us. And then livestock integration, one of my favorites. Uh, it's a good card to play when, when you've armored up. And but we, we have to get the armor portion of it in place, make that work out. Then I think we're we're in business after that. So then too, just uh, wanted to leave you with um, a couple things here. This is just a list of uh, recommended reading. And also uh, you'd be very welcome to visit our website, monopenfarm.com. And then also our YouTube channel uh, has a number of videos, maybe 70 or so from the last three years. We're building a video library as I was uh, visiting with Megan a little bit earlier and uh, kind of gives you a scenario, but uh, some, some good reading. And uh, if you enjoy the videos also, uh, check out, uh, go to YouTube and um, plug in Minokan Farm and it should bring them up for you. So with that, I see I'm uh, close to my time here and I'm going to turn it back to uh, Megan or Charles, who's ever, whoever it works. And it's actually uh, gonna come to Tim. <laughs> Say again? I said, it's actually gonna come over to me, Tim. But uh, thank you so much for that presentation, Jay. It was really good. And especially for that list of resources you've had there. I've read a couple. Uh, 1491, some of the, the publications and YouTube videos, Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown are fantastic. Uh, good speaker, entertaining. And even some of his, there's a really good video of him uh, speaking to Congress there as well and having some really good, uh, right. really good talks there. But I really appreciate what you shared. Uh, so if folks want to see more, you got the YouTube channel from Minokan Farm and also the podcasts. Exactly. But if you would please answer the questions that have been posed to you in the Q&A box there at the bottom, we would appreciate that. I'll and, do my best. All right. <laughs> and we'll move on to our next speaker. So to continue this theme of forage in the fall, next up we have Dr. Doug Tolleson, a range animal ecophysiologist with Texas A&M AgriLife Research at the Sonora Research Station, where he has been since 2016. Prior to Sonora, Dr. Tolleson was in a similar position for nine years at the V-Bar V Ranch with the University of Arizona. Today, he'll be speaking about range plant quality in the fall for livestock. Dr. Tolleson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully everyone can see and hear what I have here. We will uh, go ahead and jump right off into this then. So the topic here is uh, forage quality for livestock in the fall, particularly from our range plants. And this is going to primarily involve the, the nutrient density, the, the nutrition that plants provide to herbivores. <clears throat> We're going to talk about two primary uh, components here of the four listed protein and energy, uh, kind of the macronutrients. And it's not that vitamins and minerals aren't important. Uh, they very much are, but we could do a whole uh, seminar series about this. In fact, you can take graduate level courses about vitamins and minerals in plants. And so we're, we're going to focus on the macro energy or the macro nutrients here today. So forage quality is going to be based in, at the very elemental level, the structure of plant cells. If you'll think back to your freshman biology and perhaps you had to diagram and, and label the components of a plant cell. And then those are going to aggregate up into the morphology and the general structure of the plant. But with respect to the plant cell, we're primarily talking about the ratio of carbon to nitrogen as a overall determinant of forage quality. So carbon is going to be that primarily, which is found in the plant uh, cell wall, the structural carbohydrates, those strings of sugar molecules linked together into fiber. 
primarily cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant organic compound on the planet. And then we're going to compare that in relation to the internal components of that cell, the organelles, the cytoplasm, uh, the things that you can see depicted here in this cell diagram. And with respect to the nitrogen component of that, the nucleic acids, the proteins, the enzymes that are found uh, in those organelles as plant metabolism is occurring, <clears throat> we're primarily going to be looking at Rubisco, which is the key enzyme in the process of photosynthesis and would be found there in the chloroplasts. And it just so happens that Rubisco is the most abundant protein on the planet. <clears throat> so as we aggregate up then and, and look at the, the total structure of the plant, the relationship of those cells as they aggregate into these tissues, the relationship with quality is going to be based off of the proportion of new versus old material, live versus dead, and leaf versus stem. So animals, uh, herbivores, will tend to choose new live leaf uh, in greater proportion to that of old dead stem if they're given the choice. New live leaf is going to be represented by those plant cells which are lower on the carbon nitrogen ratio, less structural carbohydrates compared to nitrogen. And the old dead stem would be the higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, more fiber, less nutritious uh, plant material. And you, you can see in this cytoscroma that has obviously been grazed, uh, you have a combination of that and we will have various combinations of that as we look at these plants and how they grow throughout the growing season. In this graph uh, presented to us here from the Noble Foundation, looking at plant species in Southern Oklahoma, uh, there are a variety of species listed there and, and they've got native grass kind of grouped together there in the, in the top item. Uh, cool season plants would be represented by the orange and warm season by the green. And so we can see a pretty typical Central U.S. growing season there starting um, around March and ending in the uh, middle of November, basically a frost to frost type of growing season. And so we can see as the in, on the upward curve of that green uh, representation there for the native grass, that's as the plant is growing, starting to accumulate mass. It's going to have more of that new live leaf, those younger plant cells, the, the lower carbon nitrogen ratio cells as we achieve the peak growing season and then start the downward part of that curve, we would then tip over into less new live leaf and more older dead stems and reproductive tissues, seed heads. And so the carbon nitrogen ratio would, would be greater before its quality would be less. And then it would trail off then toward the end of the season. <clears throat> There's been quite a bit of work that's been done in the past uh, by researchers who have gone out and collect plant material various times of the year, different stages of, of phenology and, and different places on the landscape. This is a table from a publication that was uh, done in South Texas. Uh, very busy table, I understand, but if you look at the crude protein in the middle of this table and you look at those different species there, and then the summer, fall, and winter values, generally we can see uh, that the protein content was higher in the summer, less in the fall, and then least in the winter, and that's going to be fairly typical. <clears throat> we can also then think back to that new live leaf uh, that we talked about earlier, and uh, this is a set of data that was collected up in the northern part of Texas. Again, looking at crude protein of plant material from four different species, they're in that live, recent dead, or old dead categories. And again, we can see in the uh, spring and early summer, the live material is higher protein, than what we would see in old dead material that would still be uh, remnants from last year during that same time period, about twice as much protein. Then when we move over into the fall, which we're talking about now, uh, we can see there would still be some combinations of live and recent dead, but the live material would higher protein uh, than the dead material. All of this is going to be dictated to us, not only by where we are at that stage of growth and and the inherent characteristics of a given landscape, the, our ecosystem site, what's that soil type and, and its climate, what, what type of plant material is it able to produce? Obviously, the precipitation, the amount, timing, and duration 
the precipitation that falls is going to dictate how much forage we're able to grow. In this graph, we have a three month precipitation indicated here, uh, August, September, October from the Sonora Research Station, about a oh, two and a half, three hour drive west of San Antonio in the western edge of the Edwards Plateau. We have a standard precipitation index here, which is basically just going to be standard deviations above and below a mean. So the zero line here is the mean for that three month period, which is about eight or nine inches for us. <clears throat> and so we can see that no year is uh, very few years or quote unquote average. Uh, we're typically above or below some average oscillates back and forth. And in this 20 year period, we can see that we've had some uh, stretches of years together that were either wet during this time period or dry. Uh, but in recent years, we've kind of flip flopped back and forth. And I particularly want to call your attention to the tall green bar there in 2018, because we're going to see some other graphics and talk about that. But the point here is that there is no typical year. So even though we may have tables and charts that we can go look at, uh, the year that we happen to find ourselves in and the season and the conditions may uh, not be quote unquote average. All of this then, where we are on the type of soil, to where we are in the growth curve for a particular year, how uh, temperature and precipitation have, have come together to, to create the conditions for our plants at this given time, uh, can lead us into various different results. We can have, again, looking at side oats grama, we can have young lush green forage as depicted in the top picture. We can have uh, the picture right below that. We can have a mixture of, of green and, and older dead material and in, in the picture on the right, uh, either in the dead of winter or perhaps in the middle of a serious drought, we could have completely dry dead material. So the point here is that there is going to be no typical forage quality in the fall. I mean, we will have averages that would be long-term, but the variation above and below that uh, can be quite extreme. And then, of course, our management is going to come in on top of all of these other characteristics that we've talked about and dictate what the forage quality may be for a given species of plants or an assemblage of species on a landscape. This is showing uh, some Cytops grama again that has regrown after a prescribed fire. And fortunately with a little bit of rainfall on, on top of that. So we've got a lot of young lush green material, uh, new live leaf, low carbon to nitrogen ratio, very high nutrient quality in that. We could have very similar type of occurrence after maybe a heavy grazing event that we moved off of and then followed that up by rain. But our management is also going to dictate to us what our uh, forage quality may be. So let me show you some graphics as we kind of trail off toward the end of the talk here and look at landscape level effects. So this is a, an NDVI image, remote sensing on 400 by 400 meter pixels uh, from a University of Arizona product. And the Sonora Research Station is in the center of this. And so this is the, the most recent report that they've put out. Uh, September 6th of this year. And you can see that we're in kind of a mixed bag. We've got uh, generally overall above average. Uh, this uh, graph depicts a difference from average for our normal greenness. Uh, the amount of photosynthetic active plant material that's out on the landscape. So blue is high, brown is low. And you can see where we are right now. And this is where we were exactly a year ago. Again, mixed bag, some places better than others. <clears throat> but overall, we were much drier last year uh, than we are this year, uh, dictated by, the again, the soils where we are in the plant growth, distribution of precipitation, were we under a particular rain shower or not? And then how did our management affect how that landscape was able to utilize that precipitation when it did come? Now, Let's also look back at that year of 2018. You can see the, the deviations in rainfall graph there on the smaller version that I've included in this graph. And so here's the same view uh, centered on the Sonora Research Station from early September of 2018. And you can see that was a very above average precipitation year for this three month time period. Again, a very mixed bag though. 
uh, five, 10 miles either direction. You could go from very high above average forage conditions to very low. And even within a adjacent 400 by 400 meter pixels, you can see very high to very low. And again, probably dictated by the management of that particular piece of land. So now let's step back a, a month and look at early August 2018. Look at how much change can occur on a landscape in a 30 day time period. So we had a very wet three month period, but at the time that this image was taken, we were ahead of that. We got two inches of rain starting in the middle of August, five inches of rain in September and eight inches of rain in October. So basically about two thirds of our annual rain occurred in the three month period and the land responded very dramatically. So now let's switch gears and let's look at what livestock will tell us about how they are experiencing and harvesting forage and the quality that they're receiving from it. We're going to look at three different areas, the Trans-Pecos, the Rolling Plains, and South Texas. We will be looking at results from a technique called near-infrared spectroscopy that will be applied to fecal samples. And by doing that, uh, visual estimation there or optic estimation we can back calculate the diet quality for those animals that produce that fecal sample so we can see out in the transpecus uh, that monsoon pattern we have a bump of quality of protein in the blue digestibility in the red uh, in the spring but they primarily get their rainfall and their quantity and quality occurs during that summer monsoon in the rolling plains a very different pattern uh, we get that spring green up there and then trails off. And in this particular roughly 10 year period, we didn't have much of a fall bump in any of the averages there and, and uh, less deviation as indicated by the standard error bars in this particular region. And then for South Texas, a much flatter distribution, although some up and down in that quality during the year, probably a lot to do with the availability or not of tropical moisture and probably also due to more of a shrub component in the diet. So to wrap all this up, as in range management situations, the answer to what fall forage quality may be is it depends. Forage quality will be affected by the plant type, the functional group, the species, where we are in that growth curve, the phenology, Mount timing distribution of rainfall, and then our management, specifically fire and herbivory. So, so for grazing or supplemental feeding decisions, that's going to then be affected by our livestock species, breed class, stage of production, fall versus spring calving, growing versus mature animals, that sort of thing. The forage quantity and quality that's dictated by these uh, previous factors. I included water here. It's not a forage component, but it is important. Sometimes we have water and not forage. Sometimes we have forage and not water. Cost benefit of applying a, uh, a management practice. And then the last thing is that we absolutely got to monitor to be able to stay on top of these changing conditions. Uh, with that, I know I'm out of time and I don't have any time for questions, but that is the Trans-Pecos area of Texas on Labor Day of this year. So things can change and it it depends. That's the answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolleson. We don't have time for oral questions, but if you'd like to type a question for him in the question and answer box, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer that for you. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tim to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Megan. So next up here for the plant party, we have Dr. Ray Morans, the grazing lands pollinator ecologist for the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And he's with us to speak on the nectar plants that fuel the fall flight of migrating monarchs here in the South Central United States. Ray also serves as a partner biologist for the Natural Resource Conservation Services Central National Technology Support Center, CNTSC, here in Fort Worth, Texas. Ray lives with his wife and son on a small, small farm just outside of Stillwater, Oklahoma, and we're glad to have him here with us today to talk about the migrating monarchs. Ray, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks for uh, inviting me to, uh, to speak today. Uh, it's a topic uh, I, uh, I care about dearly, um, and of course, the South Central U.S. is just about the most important uh, place to be at this time of year for monarch butterflies. They're migrating through uh, as I speak. 
Uh, as Tim mentioned, I work for the Xerces Society. We are a nonprofit that focuses on convert, uh, preserving uh, insects uh, and other invertebrates. And I'm nested within the NRCS. So I help the NRCS conserve pollinators in the central US. So why does the NRCS work on monarch butterflies? The same reason other federal agencies are working on monarch butterflies these days, because monarchs are in trouble. This graph, this bar graph, represents the declining abundance of monarchs in the overwintering colonies in Mexico. Now they don't go down there and count because there are still too many to count. There are still millions of them and it's difficult to count millions, but they estimate the number of hectares of forest that's coated with monarchs. And back in the nineties, it was really high and it went way down in the earlier part of the millennium. So that got the federal government and state agencies interested in, in, in helping monarchs out. Some important facts you need to know. Uh, there are three main monarch populations in the lower 48. Uh, one in South Florida, one out West, which is becoming extremely small, unfortunately. And then we've got the, the larger population in the central and Eastern US. That's the one that flies down to Mexico at this time of year. Another important thing to know that many of you do know, I bet, monarch caterpillars are host plant specialists. They only feed on milkweed plants. And when I created this slide, that made me think of this awesome book. If you haven't seen this book and you're interested in milkweeds, you need to uh, download this for free. Go online and download uh, Identification of Milkweeds in Texas. And if this, if the fellows who wrote this book haven't been on a Texas plant party before, they should be, I'm sure they'd give a fantastic talk. Uh, uh, it covers all the Asclepias species in Texas. And of course, you need to know that Texas has a bunch of vine milkweeds in various genera, including such as the species Petalius palustra. Uh, I'm curious if anybody can tell me uh, where that species occurs. Maybe shoot that into the chat box at some time, time. If you know where Petalius palustra lives in Texas. Well, I talked about host plants, but we're focusing on nectar plants. Adult monarchs use a variety of nectar species, but of the thousands of species of monarchs flowering the South, they only visit a few frequently. So while they are not as specialized as the caterpillars, they are somewhat specialized. And in the fall, they're typically using plants in the aster family, in the asteraceae shown on the left. Dr. Lincoln Brower is considered the greatest monarch researcher uh, to ever live. And he made, made many contributions to monarch research. That's him on the left uh, when he was uh, visiting me up in Iowa a few years ago. He studied the milkweeds and how monarchs obtain chemicals from the milkweeds that make them poisonous to blue jays. And that's shown on the right, of course. But he also studied the monarch migration and how monarchs are getting nectar as they migrate. And very importantly, he found that they need to obtain nectar to build up fat. Why do they need fat? They need fat so they can survive the winter in Mexico. It's actually very cool down there uh, where they go up in the mountains and they need to have fat reserves and they build up those fat reserves on their flight south. Um, and this is just uh, giving us the opportunity to check out their routes. The monarchs from the upper Midwest fly south through Stillwater, Oklahoma, right past my window. Uh, we've got them flying past today in small numbers, and they're going to be going through Texas on their way to Michoacan, Mexico. The ones in the East Coast fly down along the Gulf. Some of them go to Florida, we think. So speaking of Mexico, I got to go to the overwintering colonies in Mexico a few years ago, and this is one of them, uh, an amazingly beautiful place called Sierra Chinqua. It's about 11,000 feet elevation. And at this place, uh, and others like it. I saw millions of monarch butterflies, I'm happy to say. And I noticed lots of nectar plants. So you might be wondering, maybe the monarchs could get all the nectar they need just from the plants down in Mexico. Because I did see monarchs nectaring while I was down there. Well, I asked that same question. Luckily for me, I was walking the trails with three of the world's greatest experts on, on monarchs, uh, including my good buddy, Alfonso Alonso on the left. Uh, he was a, a, one of my buddies in the 90s. I attended his wedding in Kerrville, Texas in uh, about 1996. 
and he happens to have studied the nectar plant use of monarch butterflies in Mexico. And what he told me is, Ray, there is no way in heck you could ever have enough nectar plants at these small sites in Mexico to keep the monarchs well fed. They have to be getting their nectar from Texas and Northern Mexico. It's absolutely necessary. So what are some of the good nectar plants? Well, anything in the genus Circium tends to be quite good. Uh, in my case, it's tall thistle. A South Texas specialty is Greg's Blue Mist. We in Oklahoma have learned to plant it as well because monarchs love it so much. Coniclinium gregii. The genus Helianthus. Those are just about all great. Uh, the sunflowers, of course. The solidago, the various goldenrod species, and I know there are many, many species, just about wherever you are in the eastern half of the country, and Texas has quite a few. Monarchs tend to love them. The asters in the genus Sympiotricum. One of my absolute favorite genera is the genus Verbicina. And this shows you what some say is the most important uh, nectar plant for monarchs in much of central Texas, frostweed, Verbicina virginica. Uh, I've only been to uh, central Texas a few times, but I have seen it growing in riparian zones. And uh, it is, that is said to be where the, it's particularly important that monarchs will migrate along the rivers of Texas and they're nectaring on Verbicina virginica as they do. Another really important Verbicina species of Texas and Oklahoma is this annual golden crown beard, Verbicina and celioides. And this is a photo from uh, one of my plantings uh, here at home last fall and a close-up of a monarch using this plant. This plant is an absolutely amazing all-purpose pollinator plant because it's not just used by big flashy butterflies like monarchs or the bordered patch shown on the right. It's used by small butterflies like the pearl crescent on the left. And it's used by just about every species of bee, including bumblebees shown, shown in the middle. So if you wanna keep pollinators happy, plant some of this. Um, other creatures know that it's, that it's really great for butterflies. So in this picture you, that I took this morning, you see some golden crown beard looking pretty ratty because we're in a drought. And what do you see in the middle? Well, what you see in the middle is a spider that built its web amidst the golden crown beard, knowing that, mo that butterflies, including monarchs, would be flying into the web and it would uh, have a good uh, diet of, of fresh butterfly. If you wanna learn more about nectar plants for monarchs in Texas and Oklahoma, this is a great guide. It includes information on dozens of species. And this is a product of the NRCS. I, I helped make this book, I'm happy to say. Uh, we have another version of this book for East Texas and the Texas coast. And this is what you get inside. You, you have species accounts with photos of the species. And to get these uh, as a free download, search for NRCS Monarchs. If you have happened to see monarchs using nectar plants in Texas or anywhere for that matter, uh, please send me your data. We have a database and we're interested in collecting more data so that we can refine our knowledge of monarch nectar plant use. So if you've ever seen a monarch nectaring on a native species, please email me and let me know what you saw. There's my email address at the bottom. How does NRCS help monarchs? Through their various farm bill programs. Uh, for example, on our land, we had lots and lots of Eastern red cedar. Underneath those cedars, nothing grew. It was a desert for butterflies and pollinators in general. NRCS gave me a little bit of financial assistance and technical support to help me get rid of the cedars and then I went ahead and planted some native wildflower mix. Uh, and a few months later, this is what I got. I got monarch habitat real quick. It's pretty great. If you haven't considered doing any burning, you should strongly consider it. Fire is really great for brush control, but it also seems to be really good for enhancing milkweed abundance and increasing floral abundance. So some big research needs that I'll go over quickly. How does summer fire impact fall nectar sources? I don't think we know this for Texas yet. 
What is the abundance of monarch nectar plants in rangeland in the Southern Plains? An extremely important question that Dr. Ken Spaeth uh, at the Central Tech Center in Fort Worth is uh, looking at right now. And I hope to help him with that a little bit. How has the abundance of nectar plants changed? And what are the impacts of various grazing regimes? How can we prescribe grazing to, to enhance pollinator abundance and monarch abundance? Takeaway messages, monarchs have strong preferences for some plants. Uh, secondly, if you wanna get monarchs, plant the native plants or manage your land to get those plants. And finally, if you are a farmer or rancher and wanna help monarchs, contact your local NRCS field office to seek technical and financial assistance. I need to acknowledge our supporters, including Xerces Society members. Uh, donors help us stay in business. Uh, we are a donor supported nonprofit, so please consider becoming a member. And finally, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or shoot me an email at one of these two addresses. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Thanks. you for that excellent presentation. I already see the Q&A box filling up there with 13 responses. So I'm sure if you've got any questions for Dr. Morantz, please put them in there and uh, ask him questions about fall nectaring sources, contact information, or those publications he just listed. And remember, we will put this, uh, these presentations out as a pre-recorded here probably by the end of the week or early next week. So uh, thank you again, Ray. And we'll move right on into our next talk. This one is actually Dr. Clayton, and we're going to talk about obnoxious plant management in the fall. Um, Dr. Clayton's down in Corpus, and she works with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the Department of Rangeland, Wildlife, and Fisheries Management. And her responsibilities as a rangeland specialist allow her to work with extension agents, specialists, clientele, and organizations through teaching, training, and providing technical expertise on the management of rangeland resources. Megan, take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's exciting to get to talk to you today. Um, we do have a few door prizes to give away. I was hurriedly going through there and we'll do that right after my talk. So today we're talking about obnoxious plant management, which I really mean noxious and invasive plants that we don't necessarily want on our landscape or they've become out of balance to where they're reducing the diversity of plants that we're able to grow on our land. So I kind of decided to somehow narrow all this down into a 15 minute talk that we're gonna cover 10 things that you could do this fall or winter, or you could suggest your landowners that you help do this fall or winter to help to get their place into good condition if they have some noxious or invasive plants they're dealing with. So number one is gonna be graze cautiously on invasive grasses. So once we fall into fall, a lot of our um, invasive grasses have gone pretty stimmy. They're not quite as palatable. And I feel like there is the chance that we could overgraze a lot of our native grasses or our better grazing grasses in our field. So I just want to remind you always to monitor for those good grazing grasses and make sure you're not overusing them in an effort to utilize some of those that you're hoping to get gone. A better plan might be to graze heavy very early in the season when a lot of our invasives green up faster than our native plants. At that time, it might be a better chance for you to graze very heavily and reduce the amount of invasives and allow those natives to have a chance to spring up once it greens up. Number two, shred or spray your weeds. That is a question I get a lot this time of year. Should I spray the weed problem that I'm having or should I just shred it down for the year? My question is usually, should you do either? Are those weeds taking the place of a forage grass or other plants that you're hoping to grow for the remainder of the season? Now remember, once our nighttime temperatures get to about 55 degrees, a lot of our native plants or our perennial warm season grasses that we have in Texas start to slow down as far as their growth. So you're really weighing out, is it worth doing some of these practices or should I just wait until next year to tackle my problem in a better way than I did this year? So we're talking about something completely different if we're looking at annual weeds, which again are producing seed and they come back from seed each year, 
or if we're talking about perennial weeds, because perennials have a harder root stock and they will be back next year. So a lot of times if people are trying to treat annuals this time of year and they've already seeded out, they've done their due for the year, there's really no reason unless you think you're going to open that up for forage to grow before the end of our growing season. Now, perennials might be a different story. If they um, have not seeded out, if you still want to control them, you may be able to, depending on the, the perennial plant, be able to get in an herbicide treatment. You may want to shred them down. But let's look at a study that was done, even though this was back in 2003, it's still very applicable for things that we do today. And it's looking not necessarily at the specific number that they came up with as to how much it costs to either spray versus shred, but more so let's look at the comparisons. Now we know that we have a labor cost to do either one, um, but you know how much you can do per acre is gonna vary depending on if you're spraying or if you're just mowing. And then you have costs associated with that, right? The maintenance on the equipment, um, you have the, the fuel to run the equipment. And then for spraying, you not only have that, but you also have the herbicide cost. But what they found when they shook it all out is that it's actually a little bit cheaper to spray uh, a field and actually control those plants rather than mechanically treat it. And so I think that's important to notice is that sometimes when we shred things, we think we're doing something good for the short term, but I think we need to think on a longer term, what's going to be best so that we're not dealing with the same situation in the following year. Number three is scout for weeds late winter. Remember, I said I get a lot of calls this time of year asking what to do about your weeds. And in most cases, it's too late. They've already done their due. So what we need to do is start looking in those areas where we had a weed problem very early and scout for them during our late winter when things are just coming up. The problem we have is a lot of these plants don't look like a problem when they're small. So here's a little weed in February or March. We not, might not be too concerned. By May, kind of looks like this. By August, we're seeing quite a bit across our field. I might get a call then, but more likely I get calls in September when the weed is already flowering. And what this is, is common broom weed. And so you can see that if we're having trouble with certain weeds, it's best from a management standpoint to get on those very early. So annuals, we typically, if we're going to spray them with herbicide to get rid of them, we'll spray them when they're six inches tall. So much earlier than this center picture. And then perennials, we're usually waiting until they have lots of good leaf to take in that chemical to kill that root system because it's a little bit more advanced because again, it's coming back from that same root system every year. So kind of think about what type of plants you're having trouble with, identify your plants, understand whether they're perennials or they're annuals and come up with a strategy to tackle them better next year. In this picture, you'll see there's actually a grazing exclosure in it. So where these T-posts are, cattle could not get in there to graze. And you can see that there's not a common broomweed problem inside of that fence. So we could kind of ascertain that the cattle in this situation are overgrazing the land, allowing for these weeds to become a problem. So maybe we need to change up some of our management in order to not be in a position to where we have to treat noxious or invasive plants next year. Number four is fall foliar brush treatments. So yes, even in the fall, there are some plants that we can still treat with herbicides that are noxious and some that are incredibly invasive. So some of those include Weesatch, that's a fall treatment plant, McCartney Rose and Rotama, which can be sprayed in the fall or the spring. Chinese tallow tree is the same way, fall or spring. Giant reed is also a fall or a spring spray. And black brush is typically when we're using chaparral, we spray that in the fall, although we have some research going on with some other flexible options as well. So all of these are options for potentially taking care of during the fall season, which is nice because we have slightly cooler temperatures than in the summer, but those leaves need to be in a really good condition. So we don't want to dismiss the plant still needs to be um, looking good and able to take in an herbicide effectively so that we're not wasting our time or our finances. All of these have recommendations through Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, so you can simply email me if you're needing the specific recipe or how to do that. Number five is stem spray on brush. We can do stem spray 
on our brush species, a lot of our hardwoods, um, any time of year, although we say it's best when it's actively growing. So the fall season is an excellent time to get out and do that. Stem spray is best if you have a single stem, but you could do up to three stems. Once you get more than three stems on a plant, you're usually looking at more of a leaf spray option because it's more economical and you're more likely to control the plant. Now, stem spray is where you spray about 12 to 18 inches high all the way around the tree. Usually I spray one side, walk around to the other tree side and spray that. Um, you'll leave those trees standing for a full year and a pretty simple process and it's very selective, which I like about it. Um, so we still use a triclopyr ester um, and a diesel combination. So if you need help with any of that, just let me know and I can send you the specifics. Another thing you could do during the fall or winter is cut stump treatment. Cut stump is an excellent way to get rid of brush species that you're not wanting there. Again, it's very selective. You'll cut that brush off as low to the ground and as flat as possible and spray that stump and the remaining stem with your chemical and diesel mixture. We also have a new recommendation out on mesquite trees to use Envora, a new product through Bayer Crop Science with water and an MSO. So very different. But if you need help deciding which would be most appropriate for you, just let me know. Um, when we remove that tree, really your creativity is your only limitation. You can use a shear like you see here for large acreages, or I love the brush cutters where you can cut through about a, a two and a half, three inch diameter tree like butter. It's kind of like a weed eater with a brush attachment at the end. So however you can get a nice flat cut and then you'll treat that stump immediately after after cutting. Number seven is mechanical removal of brush. So obviously you could get in there and do quite a bit mechanically, um, even though it's fall and winter time, you could grub out individual plant species. You could shred, although I think I talked a little bit about how shredding is not always our best answer. It just looks good temporarily, um, especially if you're spreading, shredding, um, re-sprouting brush species, you're really just creating a larger problem for yourself because it will come back with more stems and usually longer thorns as protection. Um, root plowing is another option where people drop a plow into the ground and so they're cutting off the uh, noxious brush about 18 inches deep to get all of that bud zone where it would normally re-sprout from. But root plowing often turns over our soil and so you're sort of forced to replant in a lot of situations. So I would use that method very sparingly. But again, if you wanna get in there and do a little grubbing, there's a great uh, time to do it while things are a little bit cooler. Number eight is mend or install fences. And you might say, wait a second, that has nothing to do with noxious or invasive plants. But I would argue that like we saw in that common broomweed picture, the way you graze has a lot to do with whether you have noxious and invasive plants spreading on your place. So if you feel like you need to add some interior fencing, or maybe even improve some of your exterior fences. Uh, the winter time is an excellent time to get out and do that. Uh, people tend to be a little bit more cheery uh, building fence when it's cooler outside. And, and also I would lead you to this uh, excellent law website that our uh, extension ag lawyer, Tiffany dal keeps up and has a million great articles on there, but there's a publication called Five Strands, A Landowner's Guide to Fence Law in Texas, which would kind of give you a little bit behind the laws and who owns fences and um, how you have to keep your cattle in or if you don't, depending on your county. All of that information is there in that publication. Number nine is install fire guards or burn, which again, you might be thinking that's not exactly on the topic, but it is because you can really manipulate your plant cover with a prescribed fire depending on your timing. So say you burned uh, late winter when those weeds are starting to pop up, you might burn them off and allow those grasses to spring up. Um, so your timing is incredibly important. And I know, especially in South Texas, we have a lot of winter burns going out. But another thing you can do is the fire lines, which are usually associated with a burn to keep a burn into a certain area. But even if you're not planning to burn, fire guards are a great way to stage yourself so that you're protecting your forage in the case of a wildfire. Um, also, it allows you to uh, create a barrier 
to where you might be able to protect a field from an invasive plant species, especially if that invasive or noxious plant is on a neighboring property that you don't have ownership over. And so you're not able to control them or to manage to get rid of them, then you might want to keep that out of your pastures. And maintaining clean fire guards is one way that you could help promote that. Um, so fire guards have a bunch of different uses, but typically we're looking at making them at least three times the height of the nearest grass. So if you think about your grass being about three feet tall, you might need at least, you know, 10 feet or so of a fire guard in place. Um, so anyway, something to think about. This also can protect your equipment and your barns and where you're storing your hay in case there is a wildfire. It will still be a concern, but it won't be as large of a concern as if you were unprepared. And the final one, number 10, is define your goals. So I believe that the end of the year, as we're coming into the end of the year, we're coming into the holiday season, we're inside a little bit more, things aren't quite as active outdoors. What I want you to think about is planning your place, planning your operation, because a lot of times when we talk about land, and I don't care if you have an acre or a million acres, we need a plan in place. And sometimes we don't treat those as important as they are, but there's something that we put money into and something that we need a plan for. So what I'd encourage you to do, and for all your professionals out there, I would still encourage you to write down your goals and objectives for next year. If we don't have these written down, there's really nothing that we are working towards. And I think that can make our careers even a little bit stagnant. So it's nice to write down new things you're wanting to learn or new opportunities that you're going to look for. Why would I say written goals? I believe if you have goals in your head, those are dreams. Once you put your goals and objectives down on paper, that's a plan. So now you have something to act on. Also, goals should be specific. They should not be, um, I want to make money or I want to make a beautiful acre. Well, you do, but what exactly are you looking for and what are you trying to manage for? I think it's important to spell those things out. We should be reasonable according to the amount of area that we have, according to our flexibility within our jobs, according to what our soils could provide on our place. It all needs to be fairly reasonable so that we don't set ourselves up for failure. But what I want to stress is that even though you write down your goals for the year, consider them adaptable. I think we need to think very um, fluidly about our goals. And just because they're written down doesn't mean you have to stay with them. They should probably change every year, if not every season, according to what we want to do with our place and the practices and the new technologies that come out. And then finally, each goal should be followed with some objectives and objectives are measurable. So those are things that you can go back at the end of the year, at the end of the season and say, did I or did I not meet this objective and check it off. Objectives are baby steps that help move us towards our ultimate goal. And I think that's one way that we can keep ourselves growing and keep our lands productive and make sure that we're always making management decisions that are going to lead us towards our ultimate place that we'd like to be. So here's my email address, my website, southtexasrangelands.tamu.edu. And if you're on Facebook, uh, I have a page that I have not posted on too much recently, but I'll try to step that up uh, called Texas Range Extension, where you can find about other opportunities or sometimes um, highlight a fun plant. So thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. And, um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Tim. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate that. Thank you for the presentation. But we're down to our last presentation. Uh, this one, I think a lot of you will find very interesting. We spoke about armoring the soil earlier, and now we're going to talk about how armoring that soil helps the soil microbes. And so with us is our final speaker, Dr. Lindsay Slaughter, an assistant professor of soil micro microbial ecology and biochemistry in the Department of Plant and Soil Science at Texas Tech University. Her lab investigates how soil microbial community structure, function, and interactions with other biota are affected by environmental disturbance, such as water and nutrient scarcity, urban development and runoff, and agricultural management conditions, such as grazing and crop production practices. Through her research and teaching, she ultimately hopes to improve plant and soil management strategies that reverse land degradation and lead to greater soil health and ecosystem function. Today, she is here to talk about seasonal variations in soil microbes. Thanks for sharing with us today, Dr. Slaughter, and you can, the floor is yours. 
Thank you all so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to give you all a little primer on kind of microbes 101, because I'm not sure how much background uh, many of you have in soil microbes. So we're going to start with that. And then I'm going to move on to talking about some of the seasonal dynamics that you see in those soil microbial communities. Uh, again, I'm an assistant professor of soil microbial ecology and biochemistry. I teach an undergraduate introductory soil science class. That's actually what I just got out of. Uh, and I also teach both undergraduate and graduate versions of soil microbial ecology courses in our department at Texas Tech. So what you're gonna see today is some things that I've pulled from each of those. And if I go into lecture mode, uh, please forgive me. I tend to talk fast and we're gonna cover a lot of ground, uh, but I wanna make sure you get uh, as much information here as you possibly can. So first of all, a little bit of a definition for you. What do we consider soil microbes? Uh, a lot of people are tempted to kind of throw anything in the soil into that microbial portion. Uh, but technically a soil microbe is anything that is microscopic. So not necessarily viewable by the naked eye uh, in sort of the typical form of that organism. We know there's a lot of variation in size ranges there. Um, but within this group, we generally include viruses, which are teeny, teeny, tiny uh, parasitic entities. And so they're basically just protein coats uh, with whole single-stranded DNA or RNA genomes within them. Uh, and they're, you know, typically range within 10 to or 20 or 100 nanometers in size, which is orders of magnitude smaller than something like bacteria and archaea, which are prokaryotic organisms. They're single-celled organisms. Uh, they're very, very small. They're usually within the one to three micron range, which is, again, I put some conversions up here. If a microbe is technically anything smaller than a tenth of a millimeter, which is about 100 microns, a bacteria could maybe only be one micron. So they are smaller than small and viruses are smaller than smaller than small uh, in the soil, but all of those are microbes. So you're seeing a, a, even now within that microbial community, pretty wide range in sizes. <clears throat> uh, we also include fungi in this group. These are eukaryotic organisms. They diverged uh, on that tree of life. They're a little bit more closely related uh, to plant and animal communities than the bacteria and archaea are. Uh, they can be single celled, such as yeast organisms, or they can be larger multicellular uh, groups. You may recognize fungi. People talk about them a lot because you can often see the evidence of those fruiting bodies, uh, mushrooms, and some of those fungal species. Uh, but they have more of a filamentous kind of thread hyphal looking growth habit. And I point out here prokaryotic organisms versus eukaryotic organisms, right? Those simple organisms and the more advanced organisms, because a lot of people tend to throw in all the microbes together and you think bacteria, archaea, fungi, those are the soil microbes. But there's a lot of differences, key differences, and a lot of nuance in the way that these bacteria and archaea and the more advanced fungi behave in the soil, their metabolic capacities, their sizes, uh, the way they reproduce and pass on their genetic information. I don't gonna have time to get into a lot of that today, but keep in mind, not every member of that soil microbial community is equal. They will be performing slightly different functions in the soil. So where do we find most of the soil microbes in the soil? I have a graph here uh, from Pierre et al from a paper. Um, and you can see this is for us, we're looking at depth as we move down this x-axis here, I know this can be kind of a different orientation for some people. And then along uh, this axis over here, I guess this is the x-axis, um, we have micrograms of carbon per gram of soil. And so that is how much microbial biomass carbon is in the soil. And most of that microbial biomass, you have those higher values within that upper, you know, 20, 25 depths of soil. And for those of you who are familiar with how soil layers, how soil horizons work, that corresponds with really that top mineral horizon. So that A horizon of the soil, which we know to generally have more organic matter, that's where most of the, the fibrous, the, the largest density of plant roots are located. And we see most of the microbial biomass uh, coming in at that, that first mineral horizon, that top soil layer. 
in terms of where they're actually located inside that soil matrix, that physical soil habitat, they're going to be within and between those aggregates and existing even within those, the pores that are forming between those aggregates. And usually uh, bound up in that soil solution, kind of moving with the water and, and, and the spaces in between those individual soil uh, particles. And so that's why things like texture and density matter for soil microbial biomass and activity there. Keep in mind that most of the microbes that you find in the soil, their greatest abundance, even within that top layer, the top mineral horizon of the soil is going to be directly up against those plant roots. Okay. And what we call the plant rhizosphere, because there's going to be cells and carbon and nutrients sloughing off of that roots. So those go, that's going to be their major food source for those microbes. So most of the microbes up against the plant root in that rhizosphere environment, this will become important when we talk about seasonal dynamics. What can soil microbes do? This is one that I could spend another hour on. This is basically what my soil microbial ecology class is about. So here it is trying to distill it into one slide for you uh, into some of the common themes uh, about the functions that microbes perform in the environment. Number one is that they're, they're basically the agents of decomposition in the soil. When you get down to the smallest particles of plant residues and animal residues, it's the microbes, the fungi, the bacteria, the archaea that are gonna be releasing those nutrients into their plant available forms. And they're going to be incorporating some of those residues into soil organic matter. So they're the ones that are building that soil organic matter, uh, especially things like fungi. I talked about fungi and bacteria have different roles. Fungi are a little bit better at degrading some of those complex residues, things like cellulose and lignin, even in their larger particles because of their high full growth habit. Nutrient transformations. Bacteria and archaea are really the stars here of various nutrient cycles. They are key members of various nitrogen cycling processes. So biological nitrogen fixation, nitrification, denitrification, kind of moving it between those organic and inorganic or different types of nitrogen in the soil. Uh, it's bacteria and archaea that do a lot of that. Uh, and transformations of nitrogen and sulfur and iron in the soil, oxidation and reduction reactions, bacteria are involved in that. So very simple prokaryotic species, but they have a lot of metabolic flexibility here. They also help physically with the soil. So a lot of these sticky, gluey substances, these little polysaccharides, little carbon sludgy goop that um, microbes produce as they are moving through uh, that soil environment, those are some of the things that actually help stick soil particles together and stick soil aggregates together. So especially at the smaller level, the bacteria are really tiny, they'll help those individual particles stick together and help those form aggregates. They help build that organic matter that also helps stick those aggregates together. Uh, on the larger scale, when you get to those larger macro aggregates, those little chunks of soil that you can pick up and your know, little granular bits of soil, fungal hyphae can kind of act like a webbing, like a mesh around some of those larger aggregates uh, and help bind those together. So microbes are also involved in physical soil stability and preventing erosion, and building soil structure uh, and, and helping kind of increase the resilience of those soils against physical disturbance. Um, also, they're pretty well known as being involved with, in plant symbiosis, uh, associated with plants either inside or outside the plants, both in good ways and bad ways. So they can either be mutualistic relationships, things like rhizobium bacteria, mycorrhizal fungi, or they can be pathogens of plants, which maybe you've heard about a little bit already. Uh, some examples of these, they could live inside the plant roots, such as endophytes. They could be outside or around the plant root, things like plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. That's that PGPR that we have here, the acronym. Uh, and there are a lot of different roles that they can take if they are helping the plant. They could either be, you know, helping nutrients become more soluble, helping take up some of those nutrients. They could extend outward and help the plant forage for water. Mycorrhizal fungi are pretty well known for this. Um, and there are some plant growth promoting rhizobacteria who help the plant because they help, you know, compete with pathogens. So they help actually defend the plant against things like herbivory or pathogens in the soil or in the above ground material. So that's the short version of that. Um, and I'm, I talk a lot about soil microbes and I, my class is microbial ecology. 
but it's really difficult to think about and, and conceptualize and study soil microbes without also considering all of the other things that are living in that ecosystem alongside them that are performing other functions, right? Nutrient cycling and things for bacteria, but there are things that are eating and preying on those bacteria and controlling their populations, things like protozoa. Uh, nematodes, either feeding on plant roots and infecting their growth or feeding on bacteria or on protozoa. Uh, there are arthropods in the soil. These include things like little tiny micro arthropods uh, that are just barely visible to the naked eye. These are springtails and your mites. They might be shredding and moving around in the litter. Um, macro arthropods as well, things like isopods, what I from Tennessee call roly polies. Uh, you may call them something different here, uh, but mostly in these environments, things like ants and termites perform the roles of the microarthropods. Um, and they actually help kind of move soil around in addition to shredding down that litter. So it's, it's smaller pieces for the bacteria and fungi to access. And of course, earthworms, uh, um, technically in that macrofauna category, well known for their roles as engineers of the soil, actually burrowing and moving soil around in the environment. So directly altering that habitat for the soil microbes. And you have to think of these as a whole community of the soil biota. Uh, and even within the microscopic members of the community, the macroscopic members of the community, you need a pretty diverse assemblage of those organisms in order for all of those processes that we need to happen in soil, right? Nutrient cycling, water holding, decomposition, all of those can really only take place if we have different members of that community working together on different steps within those processes. So an example, I talk about decomposition a lot. You really need those macrofauna. So things like the earthworms, the arthropods, to be shredding down some of that litter, sometimes directly grazing on fungi and bacteria in order for those residues to get small enough for fungi and bacteria to access. And why do we care about that? Um, very briefly, one of the reasons that we, we care most about soil organisms is because the ways that we benefit from the soil, um, food, fiber, fuel production, clean air and water, habitats for, uh, recreation, building our houses, things like that. A lot of this is driven by soil biology. Okay. So it's the things that microbes and other organisms are doing in the soil that make those ultimate benefits to us possible and keep those ecosystems functioning now and under various conditions uh, that the, that the soils are subjected to. Okay. So now knowing what we know about where microbes live, what they do, how they're affected. Let's talk very briefly about how they vary over different timescales. Um, a lot of this is both biotically and abiotically driven by which I mean just the temperature and moisture conditions, just like with a plant um, affect even small scale temporal changes in microbial communities. So just as how, you know, a plant can wilt or slow its photosynthetic rate or something like that over the course of a day, microbes can desiccate or become less active at certain times of the day based on water conditions, temperature conditions, things like that. Um, we also see a lot of successional dynamics with microbes similar to what you see with plant communities. And that can happen on a seasonal basis or over the course of several years. Um, you can see here, uh, especially in the example with fungi, the, where, the, <clears throat> where the green patches indicate very heavy amounts of fungi, the red patches indicate low amounts. You can see that between June and October, those fungi are really spreading out and kind of taking over more of that area in higher abundance because of that high full growth habit, right? So just natural growth, growth stages of those fungi. I happen to have a pretty good example here because this is partly what I did my master's work on uh, at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. And so I have samples that I collected throughout the year. And the only thing you need to know about this graph is that two points that are closer together means the microbial community is more similar, okay? So in the samples that were collected in the winter, all of those were clustered closer together than the ones that were collected in the summer versus the ones that were collected in the spring versus the ones that were collected in the fall. So that means there's natural succession and changes in that microbial community, fungi versus bacteria and so on and so forth, just throughout the seasons. And again, this happens mostly as a function of natural variation, seasonal variation in temperature and precipitation, wetter, more activity, warmer, more activity, 
droughts, less activity, things like that. Uh, can also correspond with disturbance events and also that sort of plant growth dynamics because the plants are the source of food for the microbes. So they will vary along with that. Um, you see a similar fluctuation in microbial biomass. Microbial biomass, the active portion tends to go down in the winter. You could see some buildup of dormant microbes in the winter as well, corresponding with some buildup of nutrients there. Uh, not really important what's on the axis here, but just know this is, these are different measurements of microbial activity. So enzymatic nutrient cycling activity tends to go down pretty heavy in the fall and winter compared to when the plants are more active, especially in the summer months. Okay, so in the winter, to summarize, the food source slows down for microbes, those plants are senescing, so microbial biomass goes down, microbial turnover slows, but they're still alive, okay, and there's still going to be some decomposition and some nutrient cycling happening over those fall and winter months. So some of the things that you can do to take care of your microbes in the fall and winter months is basically the same stuff that you would do in the spring and fall months. You have to protect their habitat and you have to provide a food source. So reducing chemical and physical disturbance, okay? Letting those fungal networks stay intact, those biological food webs stay intact, allowing that soil structure to build up um, and providing diverse plant residues. Uh, so whether it's active plants or uh, decaying plants, just a cover over there to keep that physical habitat stable, protected against erosion and extreme, you know, freeze thaw cycles and, and wet dry variation there. Uh, I was looking through the Q&A earlier and I see that some people tend to ask what books would you recommend? Uh, I recommend a few books. Um, Soil Science Simplified is a good primer on everything about soil if you just want to get more familiar with soil. Um, one of the documents that I cited a lot today where that food web picture came from is a recent publication from USDA, uh, but from their Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Program based on research that has been done by that program uh, called Building Soils for Better Crops. And you can actually, I believe, download a PDF of that online. Uh, and then a lot of my pictures came from the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. This is a really good uh, one to have. And I think you can get a PDF of that as well. Uh, if you just want to know more about microbes in general and why biodiversity of those microbes matter. So I know I went really fast. Um, so I, I'm going to go to the Q&A and try to answer some of those questions. Uh, go to the chat, try to answer some questions there. Thank you all so much. Do they also go through a dormancy period like plants would? Yes. Many microbes will do that. All right, thank you, Dr. Slaughter, for that uh, great presentation. And thanks again to all of our door prize sponsors. I know that Dr. Slaughter will still be able to uh, possibly type in some answers in the Q&A uh, to address some of those questions that are coming up. Again, wanna thank our door prize sponsors, Bamert Seed, Bear Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seeds, Native American Seed, Hogue Agri Partners, Renewable Resources Extension Act, Texas Brigades, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Thank you again to our speakers and to all of you for attending our fourth Plant Party webinar. Again, Plant Party is a quarterly webinar series brought to you by USDA NRCS, Texas Parks Wildlife Department, Texas AgriLife Extension Service, and sponsored by the Renewable Resources Education Act. We will be sending a link to a short survey by email, or you can type in the address you see at the bottom of your screen uh, and, and in the chat box. Please fill out the three minute survey and be sure to tell us what plant related topics you would be interested in having more training on. The next plant party will be in a few months. We'll send an email with more information to all the past registrants. Thank you very much.